uh, profit side. Next, let me take you through the highlights for the full year. Total revenue stood at 45344 million INR or 4,534 crores, signifying a growth of 9.7% on a full year basis. In US dollar terms, the revenue stood at $608.2 million, which is a growth of 9.2% and 8.7% in constant currency terms. Services revenue for the year stood at $503.5 million, signifying a growth of 9.2% or 8.5% in uh, constant currency terms. BNM revenue for the year stood at $104.7 million, which is a growth of 9.7% on a year-on-year -year basis. Group EBIT, uh, which is the highest ever, stood at INR $6297 million or 629.7 crores which is up 51.3% um, uh, compared to last year. Group EPIC margin stood at 13.9% for the year, which is up by 381 basis points and is also the highest in the last um, uh, seven years. Services margin stood at 15.3%, higher by 432 bits, and uh, DLM margin stood at 7.2%, which is higher by... Um, uh, 7.2, uh, which, which is higher by 142 bits. Profit for the year stood at INR 522.4 crores, uh, or uh, 5224 million, up 40.6% compared to last year. Free cash flow generation stood at rupees 5776 million, with cash conversion at 62.5% on EBITDA, or a conversion of 110% of uh, PAS to cash. We also declared the highest ever dividend for the full year at INR 24 rupees per share, which included an internal dividend of 10. In the last two years, we have generated free cash of 1,338 crores and have paid out a cumulative dividend of 451 crores to our shareholders. Coming to other highlights for the quarter, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the IIT Hyderabad for research collaboration to set up a private 5G center of excellence. The enterprises across industries now recognize the benefit of private 5G networks, and they're looking at network solutions that cater to the unique business context and enable their digital transformation. We partnered with iBaseP for uh, uh, um, uh, implementing the uh, uh, manufacturing systems for uh, maintenance, repair, and overhaul solutions. And this is also a very exciting opportunity because it's another great foray into digital for us. We launched firmware over the air, sorry, launch of the firmware over the air Porta solution for connected devices. As you can imagine, with the number of devices that are being connected and the whole um, uh, connected equipment that's coming in, it's quite important that there is a robust way in which the firmware can be updated, and this is a unique solution that we've come up with. We're also proud that science is positioned as a major contender in Everest Group's Peak Matrix for digital product engineering services. And uh, we've been investing heavily, as you know, in semiconductor, embedded software, hardware, etc. And also, we've come up with the solution suite of scientific and IntelliScience. And all these, um, uh, or the re these recognitions from Everest and a few others that we reported in the previous quarters are a validation of the right things that we're doing, especially on technology and enablement in areas like digital. With this, I'd like to hand over the call to Ajay, who will take you to the de detailed financial performance of the quarter. Thank you, and I will answer questions after the presentation. Thank you, uh, uh, Krishna. Uh, and I'm very delighted to say that, you know, uh, we have excellent set of results for the quarter uh, on all the parameters. And I'll start with the uh, revenue. Uh, we have delivered $156.7 million of revenue for the uh, quarter, uh, which is uh, flat uh, overall uh, in terms of the group. In services, in real terms, we have got 1.6% uh, growth. Uh, while in dollar, it is 1.1% because the cross-currency, the uh, constant currency growth is 1.6%. Uh, uh, we have done $26.1 million in BLM, which is a 9% uh, 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 degrowth in the quarter, uh, and this is in line with uh, our expectations. Uh, overall, if you see, uh, our growth from year on year is about 9.2%. Uh, DLM has uh, degrown uh, uh, year on year. Uh, there have been applied uh, side issues. 
uh, and overall uh, growth for the group is 4.6% year on year. Next one, please. In terms of the full year, uh, we have clocked our revenue at $608.2 million, split between 503 for services and 104.7 for DLM, and that translates into a constant currency growth of 8.7% uh, for services and 9.2% uh, in terms of the dollar. Uh, for, uh, in terms of DLM, we have done 104.7. Um, and uh, we have done, done a growth of 9.5%. Uh, definitely, we were gunning for a growth of, uh, you know, at the beginning of the year, 15% plus. Uh, but due to some of the supply side challenges, uh, I think we have not been able to get, we have been talking about that uh, for long quarter. But this is in line with what we anticipated for this particular quarter. Uh, in terms of the income statement uh, uh, for the quarter, uh, I think our EBIT margin uh, has been uh, for the group at 14.5% uh, compared to quarter three of 13.9%, uh, which is 60 bits uh, improvement. And uh, again, this is in uh, line with what we have done, and you will see later that for the whole year, the margin expansion is about uh, 380 bits. So I think our focus on operational improvements and other initiatives that we have been talking about, I think have played out both in quarter four as well as uh, in uh, full of the year, uh, full year. We have also tried to provide you the bridge separately that you can read uh, in terms of what has happened in terms of the change between uh, the two quarters as well as for the full year. But at a very high level, the focus of the company has been on operational improvements, uh, which includes utilization, offshoring, as well as you know, uh, doing more revenue uh, with the higher quality, which means higher margin. Uh, all these improvements have given us, uh, you know, uh, five, six percent kind of improvement. Then we have the headwinds of investments into people and long term. We also have the benefit of scale. So net net, I think we have got uh, the. Uh, I think I am talking about the uh, full year, right? Already, but uh, just to give, I think all these, these rivers have been there. You know, all these rivers that I talked about were applicable for the quarter as well as for the full year. But I just wanted to give a comfort to all the uh, shareholders that when we are looking at 14.5 uh, for the uh, quarter or 13.8 for the year. We have made adequate investments during the year and also plan for the next year in terms of the long term. Uh, and typically, we are spending one and a half to two percent in terms of the investments into the business for future, and we are doing the right uh, investment for retention of the people and motivation of the people. Uh, in terms of the uh, fact, uh, you can see uh, we have increased it 40.6% uh, year on year uh, and about 17% uh, uh, quarter on quarter. ETR is 24.6, but I would say ETR at a overall level uh, uh, is uh, going to be uh, uh, more like 27% uh, for the uh, next year, and we'll talk more about it. But we uh, are looking at, uh, you know, ultimately a rate of about 25% for India, and uh, with a little higher uh, interest, uh, the tax rate uh, for the US we will be at uh, 27%. And uh, I would say uh, the most important highlight in this is uh, that, you know, 10% growth. Definitely, we are not meeting what we would have planned to do at the beginning of the year. But at about 9-10% growth on the top line, we have delivered a growth of 40% on the bottom line and of about 40% uh, in terms of the 50% uh, at the EBIT level. So there has been a lot of focus to make sure that you know we focus uh, on the uh, delivering the profit and the profitable growth, and that is in line with uh, what we had planned internally. This I would uh, uh, let you uh, read. Uh, we are completely providing you the details of you know what has helped us both for the quarter as well as for the uh, year in terms of various levers that have worked on the market. This really helps you, especially our analyst friends, to understand what has happened. Cash generation. Uh, uh, first, I think in terms of the cash, we have a healthy cash position. Uh, INR uh, 15, 6, 8, 9, uh, and uh, at a, uh, which is about $200 million plus. We have generated a cash of uh, $1284 million uh, in the particular uh, uh, quarter, which is a conversion of about 
uh, 51%. Uh, I would like to call out that in last quarter we had a uh, conversion of 70% plus. So when you look at this number of 51%, uh, with some exceptional collections and some other things that happened in quarter three, we are not worried for H2. Per se, we are continuing to be at 65% plus. And if I come to the year, uh, we have done a free cash flow of 5776 uh, million, uh, which is uh, again a conversion of about 65.2% for the uh, full year. Uh, and if you see the conversion of uh, net profit, I would like to uh, you to have a look at uh, the financial year 22. Uh, we are able to convert 100% uh, of net profit into the free cash flow. And we are confident of uh, these levels of 65% plus minus 5% uh, uh, in terms of very high growth year uh, versus, uh, you know, uh, uh, other scenarios in terms of uh, more investment. But I think we are uh, confident that 65 to 70 uh, for uh, services and about 50 to 60 for BLM we continue to generate. You will also note that we have generated 499 million of free cash flow in BLM compared to 84 million, which is a significant uh, increase. And we still want to improve further, and you will see in the coming year there will be a further significant improvement in case of BLM, which will also help for us as a group. Uh, there are uh, one more thing I would like to mention. You will see uh, in the detailed investor update that there is a continuous focus on all the levers of free cash flow. One of the important ones has been that we have been able to achieve six days reduction in DSO for the particular uh, for this particular year. That's on top of 11 days that we had done in the previous year. So I think that 17 days reduction is really helping us. Uh, and also, I think capex is further optimized. And of course, there is a profit uh, increase that is also uh, helping us. And uh, last comment from my side that you know, in terms of the other income also, if you look at uh, there have been some. Uh, headwinds on uh, some of the European currencies because of the situation. But I'm happy to inform that, you know, whatever is the impact on p &L, the gains in our other income have uh, far exceeded uh, the losses and we are for the next four quarters as well placed at a very nice uh, situation so that our other income will also help. This also impacts our uh, cash generation. So that's how uh, we are confident of maintaining these levels of conversion for the company. With this, uh, I'll hand over to uh, Karthik. Thank you, Ajay, and uh, good day, everyone. And we are pleased with the performance of Q4 and continuing on what Krishna and Ajay has talked about. And we have witnessed uh, a services growth of 1.6% in constant currency, and this is a third successive growth in services. I think we want to continue to build the momentum on services. And also, if you take a view on the table on the left-hand side, and aerospace, which is starting to grow 10% uh, close to year on year. I think we have not reached the peak of aerospace yet, but 10% is something that we are really happy with the progress that we made. We talked about last year's same time saying that that's the bottom that we hit. I think that's definitely continuing. The momentum is there, but it's not to the extent that we want it to be. And the rail transport, I'll cover it in the next slide. And the communication and utilities uh, definitely are building the a scale and uh, with 3.8% quarter on quarter growth, and specifically comps has grown by 6.4%. And uh, this is something that we expected to continue even for the next financial year. And also, in terms of uh, portfolio, which has grown by about 18% year on year, I think we expected the portfolio sectors to lead our growth. I think that happened to be true for uh, this year. And also with offshore mix at 51.6%, and this is highest ever we have seen on the offshore mix, and about 1.8% higher as compared to the last quarter. And also the utilization continued to be at a high level of 86% and above. We also won about seven large deals, and uh, we talked about our uh, focus in terms of winning more large deals. I think that's continuing. And interestingly, there are six from services, and within that three are from telecom, and one from auto, medical, and semiconductor. And one is a composite bill to spec uh, deal, and that is from the transport uh, vertical. And in terms of our uh, order intake and our signed services order intake is up by 13.1% year on year, and the group order intake is down by minus 11.9%. But this is only a seasonality, and we don't really have any challenges in terms of the order book and uh, order intake. So in terms of full year, and uh, we have seen uh, growth across all the segments, I think that's definitely good. Transport has grown by 1.1%, and communication utilities have grown by 12.6% year-on-year, and portfolio has grown by 17.5%. 
And interestingly, uh, we talked about rail, and uh, we have seen a volume growth of 7% in terms of build hours, but the revenue was down by 3% due to significant amount of offshoring. And I'll also touch upon the trends for next financial year and uh, some consolidation in the customer segments. We're going to push more cost savings and uh, synergy benefits, and that will probably drive more offshoring. So we will find some kind of a muted growth for H1, but H2 of the fiscal 23 will continue to see a growth in the rail business as well. And in terms of growth uh, for the group, stood at 8.7% in constant currency, and we are also pleased to uh, to see our rapid performance growth of 51% year on year. And this is led by offshoring to the extent of 500%, utilization improvement by 3%, and uh, all this helps us to uh, manage uh, a bit performance of 50% plus. And also in terms of five pillars, and we continue to see momentum on five pillars, which has grown by 21%, which is close to 2x of the company growth. And uh, we have added about 580 heads last quarter. I think that's definitely a positive sign for what we expect to see for the next couple of quarters. If I try to deep dive into each of the segments and uh, starting with uh, transportation, I think as we talked about uh, fiscal 22, we have seen double digit growth close to it. And we expect uh, this is going to be a still sluggish uh, sector as far as aerospace is concerned. We will soon see growth in the next financial year, which is fiscal 23. And as far as rail is concerned, we expect the first half to be uh, muted. And uh, we do expect the second half uh, uh, to really try significant growth. And some of the key wins that we had uh, in the last quarter, which includes uh, areas in aftermarket and some of the ITAR work in embedded and industry 4.0, as well as the urban air mobility segment. I think these are some of the expansions that we are getting into. It's not about conventional aerospace, and we really start moving into the segment of uh, air mobility. And that's where we are really seeing the growth uh, that's being built up. And as far as rail is concerned, and we talked about some of the consolidation, interestingly, we are seeing momentum on rail signaling and embedded system and digital solutions, and we expect this to uh, lead to growth for us in the next financial year. And DLM, which has uh, witnessed a degrowth, which is due to the material availability from the long lead time for some of the materials, and we do have a robust order book, but the execution uh, uh, as for the plan, is going to be difficult with the challenges on semiconductors that is faced by the entire industry. If you go to the next slide, the communication segment, which continues to build the robust uh, growth that we are anticipating uh, even for fiscal 23, and we won three major deals in Q4, which I talked about, and one of them is for a customer who wants to roll out the broadband network in Canada. And uh, this is an interesting one for us where we are able to bring a digital solution for the fiber rollout, and this is going to be first of its kind for us, and we hope to continue to build on similar priorities with many other customers. Private 5G Network Center of Excellence, collaboration with IIT, I think this is going to allow us to test various use cases and really allow the interoperability of network components from various industry leaders. And we continue to remain positive for fiscal 23, and we hope uh, this segment will show a double digit growth even for fiscal 23. Utilities, which has witnessed a small degrowth in Q4, and uh, this is more to do with the cyclicality of the major project execution. We continue to make progress with some of the recent wins in APAC to deploy a cloud native uh, next generation spatial information system. And uh, we are continuing to make progress on digital. Uh, utilities, and uh, this is going to be a growth segment for us even for the currency. Digital, I think this is one area we really have come a long way in the last 18, 24 months, and uh, the growth is driven by operational technologies combined with our domain expertise, and we are able to really establish ourselves as a digital transformation partner for our customers, and uh, the proof of the pudding is some of the engagement we are starting to do includes the industry 4.0 implementation for an engine manufacturing customer in North America, as well as setting up a consulting uh, roadmap in terms of implementation of MRO solutions for an APAC customer, and which includes the tracking, smart operations, as well as supply chain. And some of the recognition from analysts have also reinforced the state in terms of our uh, robustness of the digital solutions that we are building up. 
For the portfolio services, I think uh, we have seen the uh, growth of uh, more than 35 percent from medical, and we expect that to continue. And the growth is led by demand from digital engineering services for medical device platform development, embedded software, and software services for next generation products, and also quality and regulatory services in compliance with the uh, regulatory requirements. I think the regulatory environment is getting tough, and we do see uh, this as a potential opportunity for us to provide to provide the QARE services for many of our customers. Semicon, and it's witnessed a small uh, growth last quarter, but uh, we are continuing to build momentum on semiconductors, and we have capabilities both on turnkey SLS services. I think that's really with confidence that we will continue to really uh, show growth in fiscal 33, and this is going to be one uh, segment which will definitely witness more than 20% uh, plus growth for the next financial year. Mining and natural resources, this has seen close to 70% growth in fiscal 22, and we have added about 12 uh, logos in this segment. And the acquisition that we made about 15 months ago with IG Partners is really proving to be uh, very well for us, and we continue to see a momentum around ESG sustainability and digital uh, transformation initiatives for the mining segment. To go to the next slide, this is on the energy industrial plant engineering. This has grown about 20% year on year, and uh, we will continue to make progress on this segment. And uh, we are adding new logos, and we are also expanding into some of the customer relationship in this area. So we are seeing growth led by digital technology transformation around the portfolio of our customers. Geospatial, which has witnessed margin decline, and uh, except for one customer, I think this segment has seen the growth in fiscal 22. And we continue to build momentum of uh, expanding uh, our capabilities into Earth Observatory in various domains like the mining and communication or motor utilities, as well as expanding into the high tech segments. And this is a really an exciting segment for us in the next 12, 18 months based on the plans that we laid out. Automotive and mobility, which has uh, witnessed a sequential growth in Q4, and we continue to uh, see a strong, robust demand from automotive side, and we expect this to. Uh, grow significantly in the next financial year. We started making investments over the last 24 months, and that's starting to pay off for us. With that, I'll hand it over to Krishna for uh, providing the outlook for the state currency. Thank so in terms of the output for FY23, um, in terms of revenue, we're quite confident that the uh, growth in revenue will be in the 13 to 15 percent uh, range in constant currency for the group. Uh, in DLM, we continue to have supply side ch challenges, uh, which means that uh, we're anticipating that uh, the growth for DLM will be lower. It will be in the uh, high single digits. Um, so, of course, the inference is services will do a little bit better than uh, DLM. Um, in terms of uh, EBIT margin, uh, we expect the uh, full year margin to be in the range of 13 to 14 percent, uh, which is in line with what we've done uh, this year. Uh, again, we um, continue to anticipate uh, a, a tough supplier environment from a people perspective, and therefore we believe it will be uh, it will be it, it, it may be quite difficult to significantly improve uh, margins from where they are, at least in the uh, coming year. In uh, FY23, our effective tax rate will be around 27%, given uh, all the jurisdictions, etc. We will, uh, we believe that we will be in that range from an effective tax rate perspective. So, net net, I just want to um, uh, um, summarize this by saying I think uh, we've had a reasonable year, obviously, in uh, FY22, but uh, we have a much greater degree of confidence in terms of what will happen in uh, FY23. Um, this is the uh, uh, the uh, outlook that we're giving is based on the backlog that we have, based on the customer mix and, and various other parameters, which gives us a fair degree of confidence that we can deliver within uh, within that range. With that, I'll hand it back to the moderator to uh, curate the question and answer session. Thank you very much, sir. We will now begin the question and answer session. Anyone who wishes to ask a question may press star and one on your touchdown telephone. If you wish to remove yourself from the question queue, you may press star and two. Participants are requested to use handsets while asking a question. Ladies and gentlemen, we will wait for a moment while the question queue assembles.
The first question is from the line of Sanjay Avadramani from Envision Capital. Please go ahead. Yeah, good evening, sir, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. So my question was on the line of uh, the attrition rate. Can you highlight something on the full year uh, attrition rate? Uh, yes, of course. So for uh, just give me one second. Uh, Give us one second, and full year is not on the yes. Well, um, you have the full year number. I'm sorry, uh, why, why don't we uh, uh, come back to that because uh. The uh, quarterly attrition rate actually came down about 250 uh, basis points compared to Q3, and uh, it is at 26.9% uh, compared to 29.3% that was in uh, Q3. So for the for the um, 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 quarter, it was 26.9, and uh, if you look at uh, the um, uh, actually the full year number is also more or less there. I think it was a 27% number. But the good news is uh, it's actually trended downwards, and uh, from a uh, obviously. From, I think we started off at 26, went to 27, then 29, and now we're back to about 26%. So that's the uh, trend of attrition for the year. And, and actually, we're now quite confident that it is on a lower trend, which is a good situation because that really has been the biggest challenge for us in terms of delivering some of the revenue growth we anticipated. Okay, okay, okay. So uh, is my understanding correct that uh, you previously mentioned that 27% is the tax rate for uh, financial year 22? I think uh, in terms of uh, the uh, loss approach, we are saying uh, uh, it will be uh, 27%. That's right. Okay, okay. And uh, just to confirm it, that the revenue is the guidance you've given is 13 to 15% range in constant currency for 23, and EBIT margins will be 13 to 14%. That is right. Both assumptions are correct. That's what I'm saying. Okay, okay. So, uh, sir, just a follow-up question on the attrition side. I mean, uh, uh, do we, I mean, plan to hire some additional hirings, then train them, and then we board them for these uh, work in the IT sector? I mean, as we see, I mean, the other competitors are uh, hiring, I mean, in bulk for these fresher hirings. Uh, I mean, are we on the same page, or we are uh, moving ahead in the same, I mean, an, another direction in this? Yeah, Sanjay, I think uh, Karthik here, and let me take this question. And uh, the way we are really looking at it is there are three ways that we are trying to strengthen our uh, recruitment practices. One is uh, the fresher and uh, hire and train deployed model. And second is we are also trying to look at acu hire, which is something that we are trying to uh, onboard resources through a rebadging model. And third would be uh, what we call the lateral model. So we started up with laterals. We started moving into a few higher, and we are in the plan of uh, adding uh, significant resources over the next 12 months, both on the fresher as well as on the lateral side. We are starting to create a skill academy, which would really help us to build the skill uh, pool, and uh, we would definitely have uh, more progress to update in the next one or two quarters on this. And also, we have got the full year number, 26.2% uh, is the number. Okay, so this is the attrition for FY22, that is 26.2%, right? That's right. Okay. So, so can you, I mean, uh, just to reiterate, I mean, can you give us some count? I mean, what is the plan you plan to hire for FY23? I mean, just an overall count of the employees? Yeah, I think it's a, a bit difficult to give an exact count. I mean, we obviously uh, are hiring uh, quite aggressively, and we're also hiring in line with the uh, revenue uh, outlook that we just uh, talked about. So, uh, I mean, we don't anticipate, if anything, we anticipate offshore to increase a little bit from where, uh, where it is. Uh, we anticipate that growth to be quite uh, across the board. So it, it, it's not that, uh, you know, it's one industry. So it, it's just an extrapolation at that point, right? I mean, if, if uh, offshore is going to increase, we're going to grow 13 to 15 percent. Most Sorry, most likely we'll add, you know, 15 to 17 percent or something like that. Okay, sir. This answers all my questions. Thank you so much and good luck for FI23. Thank you. Thank you.
The next question is from the line of Sandeep Shah from Equiris Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, just the first question is in terms of guidance. So when I strip out the DLM growth, assuming 7 to 9% within the guidance for FY23, I get a number of roughly 15 and a half to 17 and a half for the services business revenue growth in FY 2023. And uh, this will require roughly 4 to 5% compounded Q1, Q growth uh, from 1Q to 4Q of FY23. So just in FY22, we started with a double-digit constant currency growth, which we downgraded to US dollar revenue double-digit growth. And actually, we have come out with a 9% US uh, dollar revenue growth. So there has been a miss in terms of what we started originally in terms of guiding our services business versus delivery in FY22. So what makes us confident that the same thing may not repeat in FY23? Uh, because FY23 may have a higher number of macro issues as a whole. Yeah, I mean, uh, we have to strip out the macro issues and let's assume that, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing that comes at a at a existential level at us because that's a different uh, story. But uh, uh, fair comment, see that the, if you look at the biggest reason for that challenge uh, this year has been some of the stuff, some of the supply side issues, right? We haven't been able to fulfill the supply at the rate at which some of the demand has uh, come in because we still remain in a fairly robust demand environment. Now, um, also the other thing in terms of the supply that's happened is, uh, you know, we, we, we were historically strong in some areas like mechanical data, et cetera, whereas the growth is coming in some newer areas like embedded digital. For example, our digital pipeline, I think, grew by 50% even last quarter and our order intake was up, I think, 60 or 70 percent compared to last year. And and, and so on with uh, embedded and so on and so forth. So that pivot to, to say that, you know, from the growth and from the capacity from the traditional areas to new areas has taken some time. And, and the fact that we have that capacity um, now coming online, we have the recruitment engine online, we've significantly strengthened, we've added 52 recruiters in the last quarter, we've significantly strengthened that uh, um, uh, uh, pipeline of recruitment. You know, taking all those things into account, it gives us, you know, again, there's no guarantees in life, as you know, it, but it gives us a lot more confidence of this number, uh, because it's also been vetted a little bit to say, okay, what are the risks, what are the opportunities, and really rate them in the current manner, or the correct manner, and then come up with this number. So, your, your observation is right, I mean, we've had a bit of a miss in terms of revenue, uh, but in terms of uh, uh, this year, we believe that, uh, you know, the, the, the issue that made us have that miss, especially around the uh, supply chain for talent, has been at risk. The demand environment remains quite robust still, and, and therefore, you know, our confidence is higher, I, I, you know. Again, I can't say I'm 100% confident because that's a misnomer, but our confidence is significantly higher, and that's based on, on some of this uh, factual data. Yeah, Krishna, just further to that, that means the first half seasonally strong for you and the industry. When we have to do a lot of heavy lifting in our services business, we have to grow by mid to high single digit Q1, Q. Is it what we are forcing uh, while giving this guidance? Sorry, I think the line is not very clear. Can you repeat that? No, what I'm saying is generally the first half for the industry is uh, seasonally better and for us also it's seasonally better. So yeah. to achieve this services growth guidance of 15.5 to 17.5, we have to do a heavy lifting with a growth of mid to high single digit Q on Q. Are we baking this into our budgets while giving this guidance to services business? Yeah, so uh, sorry again. The line is very clear, but uh, isn't very clear. But from what I understood, yeah, I mean the the growth will be spread through the year. You're right. I mean, from first Q onwards, we need to see some some reasonable growth because I mean, obviously, back ended growth is uh, is not a is not the right way to look at it. So, so yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, we are seeing uh, uh, things shape up quite well even in the uh, first uh, quarter of the year, and uh, that will really lead to um, um, uh, the numbers that we're talking about. So, so I'm, I'm sorry the line was and clear so we can we can sync up offline but uh, if that was the question then then yeah we are we're quite confident that there is a good runway to it okay okay and uh, i think just wanted to understand is there any one off in a sgna line my has shot up so materially on a qmq basis and also depreciation for the last two quarters has been trending down is it a new normal to factor as a whole uh, 
I think on your question on uh, SD and A, uh, I think uh, if you compare it to quarter three, yes, there has been one off. But when you compare it to quarter one, because this is also SD and A and investment. So when you look at uh, them together, from Q3 to Q4, yes, there has been some uh, one off. But when you look at Q4 to uh, the uh, you know our planning next year, so the way it is happening is that you know we are getting a benefit of about two percent on scale. We do have uh, uh, you know another investment of about two percent, which is towards uh, you know the various initiatives to drive growth, uh, solutions, and things like that. So I think uh, from the perspective of Q3 to Q4, yes, there are some one offs. But if you see in steady state, uh, do you uh, do we continue, will we continue to make those investments? Yes, we continue to make those investments. To that extent, I would not say that you know the SGNA uh, will uh, go down, and this is SGNA plus investments, SGNA and investments. Yeah, and this last question in terms of margin guidance. So we have given 13 to 18 percent guidance, while the exit rate is 5 percent kind of a margin. So, are we saying margin may also have a downside on a YOY, or we may be at a base case or a worst case scenario, we may be flattish on a YOY basis in FI22 versus FI22? And when are we planning for a wave hike, and what could be the quantum of impact uh, on a Q1Q basis? Not able to hear you clearly, but what I understood was that, you know, uh, what would be the impact of that range of growth on margin? Is that your question, Sandeep? No, what I am saying is, uh, in terms of the full year guidance on margin, uh, we are... Maybe we can come back to you, Sandeep. Uh, your line is not clear. Maybe you can dial in again and we can take the next question, meanwhile. Okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, before we take the next question, a reminder to the participants. Please limit your questions to two per participant. For any follow-up, may be requested to rejoin the queue. The next question is from the line of Mohit Jain from Anandrati. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, sir, one more I missed on your commentary on the segment for services. So, you guys spoke about aerospace being or getting back into the growth trajectory for 23. But on the so, real side, uh, Mohit, Mohit yes. uh, may I just kindly uh, stop you for me? Uh, moderator, uh, we are not getting uh, the clarity in the voice from the uh, Questioner, can you please help us? Uh, sure. Uh, Mr. Jain, uh, if you can take the phone off speaker, please, uh, because your voice was going in and out a bit. I am not a speaker, actually. I could hear the previous participant as well. Okay, uh, you Maybe may... There is a problem on our side. I'm sorry for that, uh, Mohit. Uh, uh, yeah, I can hear his questions as well. So I think maybe you can reconnect that. Maybe you can repeat the question. Uh, okay, so I know... Yeah, I can hear clear you clearly. Okay, my question is related. Yes, yeah, my question is related to services business. And in the commentary, you guys said that aerospace is likely to come back in 23. So that is obviously one segment we are positive on. I missed your remark on rail. So rail had a decline last year. Should we expect that decline to sort of continue next year, or that is something which you guys are more hopeful given where your pipeline or order book is? Oh, great, yes. Yeah, maybe uh, I'll answer that more, and uh, I hope I understood your question. So aerospace, like we talked about, we have seen a 10% growth in fiscal 22, and we are not seeing that it has fully come back to where it was uh, pre-pandemic, and we expect it to fully recover by fiscal 24. That's what the analyst report indicates. We will continue to see a growth in double digit for aerospace for fiscal 23, and we will still not have reached our peak in uh, uh, fiscal 20. Having said that, in terms of rail, and we talked about some of the consolidation of uh, uh, customers and uh, some of the synergy benefits that need to be drawn out, and we do see that uh, the H1 of fiscal 23 could be muted on rail, and we are seeing momentum in the form of uh, rail signaling, embedded systems, and digital solutions uh, expanding in H2 of fiscal 23. So we will see that as a transport segment, we will definitely see a growth uh, in fiscal 23 and far better than what we have seen in fiscal 22. So that 15% guidance is essentially coming, or we can assume it to be largely coming from communications and portfolio. Yeah, if you look at the non-transport for fiscal 22, that has grown by 15% year on year. So we are continuing to build the momentum on the non-transport. If the transport also joins on the growth bandwagon, I think we expect it to be a, 
uh, slightly uh, helping us on accelerating the growth and that's the confidence that we have today. Okay, and second thing is the, the digest number that you guys are giving are totally organic uh, based on today's situation. Is that correct? That's right. Yes, absolutely. Okay, and last was on the TCV. Like our TCV is growing at a slower pace and I'm again referring to only services, not to DLM. But relatively our TCV, while it has improved over the last few quarters and we are talking about large deals, the number is moving a little slowly compared to the industry. Uh, so by when do you intend to sort of fix it and how should we read your TCV on the services side going forward? Like what is, is something which you guys are expecting or will it still take some time? before TCV catches up with the revenue growth aspiration? Yeah, I think uh, on TCV, I'm thinking, you know, it's, TCV is also a relative thing, right? I mean, all said and done, we have to look at it from the context of how the uh, uh, how the contracts in our industry are, uh, are uh, awarded. Uh, and also, I mean, obviously, you can't compare our TCV to TCS's TCV, for example. So I think where we are, we feel quite confident because, you know, just looking at the nature of our business on how contracts are awarded, how uh, work packages are awarded, etc. We actually feel quite confident that it is much better than uh, it has ever been. I mean, the TCV is higher than it has ever been. So, again, it is relative. I would compare it more to ourselves than to the general industry. So what I mean to ask is a 15 to 20 percent kind of a TCV growth is uh, what you guys think can sort of sustain? Or do you think, like, uh, because last four, eight quarters were a little more volatile, Going ahead, should we assume this 15-20% kind of a TCV number or should we assume some volatility? Uh, I think there will be volatility in TCV. And just again, based on the industries that we're in and, and the size that we're in, there will always be a volatility in TCV. And that's why I say, you know, we have to look at it as a sort of a running number rather than a point in time number. And from a running number perspective, I think we've had a fairly good um, 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 you know, in last eight quarters, like you said, and we feel fairly confident on the backlog, just looking at the backlog where it, where it stands. Okay, perfect, sir. Thank you, and all the best. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Vikas Ahuja from Antic Stock. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi. Uh, congrats on great execution. Uh, Krishna, on our guidance, uh, have we baked in uh, any kind of macro risk uh, while, while you know, making the guidance, or we try to be a little bit conservative, considering second half there could be some risk. Uh, yeah, yeah I think, uh, we, we haven't really taken any major macro issues because I think the quantifying those macro issues is very, very difficult. Now, what I'll say is we've taken into account things like, you know, the, the supply market is going to still be quite constrained. Therefore, we will have to be aggressive with salary increases. We will have to be a little bit more reasonable in terms of joining side. You know, all those things we have uh, taken into account, absolutely. And, and we've also on the conservative side. I mean, even salary increases, et cetera, we've budgeted at a number which we've never done in the past because we're looking at a fairly robust uh, environment. Or, you know, we, we, we anticipate the Karthik's point about rail. We anticipate growth coming back because some of the uh, clients that we've been working with and some of the merger situation, et cetera, are, are starting to really play out and, and honestly play out to our advantage. But we're also being conservative to say that, you know, it might not happen quarter two, it might happen quarter three. Those kinds of things we have taken into account. But if you look at the sort of the global macro issues like the Ukraine crisis and oil crash, those things honestly we haven't because, you know, unfortunately with those things till they know, you don't know that they're happening. Sure, thanks. And and lastly, what's leading to this uh, 200 basis point increase in tax guidance? Uh, thank you. I think it's based on, uh, if you look at the uh, provisions of the special economic zones, because of our position of lower tax arises out of, you know, our operations in 11 units in SEGs. And uh, from 1st April, many of them get into the uh, different levels. You know, you get 100%, then you get 50%, and then uh, it becomes zero. So I think there is a switch over. Now we are looking at, you know, what tax rate makes sense for us. Should we continue with these benefits? Or should we go into the 25% uh, rate that the Indian government allows us? So we will take that call during the period. In this, uh, we have uh, made an assumption that we are looking at India tax rate at 25%. I hope that clarifies the question. Sure, thank you.
thank you a reminder to the participants please limit your questions to two per participant should you have any follow up may be requested to rejoin the queue the next question is from the line of anupam parnaik from alliance global investors please go ahead i uh, thank you for the presentation and congratulations on a great set of numbers uh, i have two questions uh, one of them is regarding acquisition i mean it would be helpful if we could just get some guidance as to you know what you are expecting for f523 and secondly i mean in, in relation to high inflation across various markets and also the higher attrition rates that the industry is seeing uh sort of you know it will be helpful to understand how that has impacted the staff costs for fy22 and what should we think for fy23 absolutely so i think uh, from an attrition perspective our view is you know the market has still not cooled down in any manner so therefore you know while well, the 20 Nine percent is quite high last quarter. We, we believe that it will be more of between 20 and 25 percent, and, and um, that number and that assumption is also quite important in terms of how we plan for our staff, plan and therefore plan for capacity and therefore plan for budget. So we, um, I would be, um, um, while I'm saying 20 to 25 percent, I would be very surprised if it's at the lower end of that range. I think even for next year, we have to still plan uh, attrition to be, you know, more towards the higher end of that range. Just because the supply side challenges are not eased yet, and the demand uh, uh, scenario has not uh, eased yet. So, again, like I said, you know, we we just have to plan for it um, and and hope for uh, or, or uh, sort of plan and and be ready for a 25 percent attrition number, and that's what we will plan our capacity and and so on around. Um, in terms of last year, you know, obviously there was a fairly significant challenge that we faced on the supply side. We've given up at least a couple of points of growth uh, uh, because of the uh, attrition and because you know, we, we did not have the capacity and the staff when we needed them. But again, I think that's a key lesson learned, and that's actually something that we also had a long uh, conversation around the board meeting earlier today in terms of making sure that we we understand the lessons learned and we're really able to uh, mitigate and manage it and those uh, lessons learned. So it's, we're not out of the woods yet, and, and uh, one quarter uh, does not make a trend. I'm not saying attrition has come down. We've had a decent quarter, and especially if you look at most of our competition, actually this is, this is also a good comparison. Most of our competition is actually showing increased attrition or even significantly increased attrition, uh, whereas our attrition mm -hmm. has come down to take it as a good sign because we've done a lot of hard work. I mean, we've done a lot of things which are unique, um, both in terms of compensation and also on the softer side. And we hope that that's what's playing out. And, and you know, I'll say 20 to, we're planning for 25, we're hoping for 20, but we'll see is that a number set. Got it. And the second question was regarding uh, sort of another inflation impact on the business. I mean, how should we think about that in terms of the staff costs for FY23? And also, if you could share some color as to sort of, you know, what sort of inflation you had in for staff costs in FY22, that would be helpful. Oh, oh sorry. So on the, um, obviously, it's a, it's a very rough inflationary situation, and we've not seen these inflation numbers in many countries for a long time. So it's going to have a, a, a fairly deep impact, or sorry, a fairly significant impact on the uh, staff cost, and that's why we're planning around things, and we still see some good room for uh, improvement in efficiency and, and, and operational uh, metrics. But that's why we're still saying margin will, will be in the 13 to 14% range, because salary increase is going to be a major headwind uh, this year. And we've, we've planned on a fairly robust, uh, fairly attractive, hopefully, um, uh, salary increase. Um, Sorry, what was the second half of your question? It wasn't very clear. Uh, sorry, what was the uh, inflation that you saw for FY22 in terms of the salary cost? R I mean, rough, rough estimate without getting into any specifics. It, it'll, you know, we, 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 it'll be in, in the 10% range in India. You know, it'll be, uh, typically we've done 2% range in uh, overseas. It'll be uh, maybe um, uh, 4% this time overseas. So maybe 4, 10, 12, something like that. 4, sorry, overseas, 10 to 12% in India. Got it. And again, these are very, very rough numbers because it's going to be all over the place. There are groups which will be much, much higher than that. Uh, but this is just sure. a rough uh, 
Uh, so I can just also add, uh, you know, because uh, as Krishna said, it's an extremely sensitive issue. We have to make sure that, you know, we come back to continue 25% as the first phase and then sub 20%. So what we are also doing is, uh, of course, the uh, increases like last year are going to be in three phases. And also, I think uh, uh, as this situation is developing, we have kept that flexibility. We'll be able to make sure that, you know, we are able to prioritize and do that. So I think just see, uh, you know, that uh, some of these things, what we are saying, uh, are sort of directional yeah. and each country and you know each skill set is being very carefully planned to make sure that you know uh, people are taken care of in line with the trends in the market and the skills that are there in the market. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Sulab from Morgan Stanley. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Uh, one is on the uh, revenue growth guidance. So going back to the comment made earlier where we mentioned that the service revenue growth uh, will be spread out through the quarters. Uh, but, then, but then when we were making the comments on the vertical side, we said that uh, the rail growth will be driven in 2H uh, while it will be muted in 1H. So just trying to understand that which vertical would be doing the heavy lifting in the first half for you to be able to spread the growth through the year? Maybe I'll take the question, Shilad the topic here. And uh, we expect a strong growth uh, led from communication to medical, mining, and semicon, and automotive. I think these are going to really lead our growth in the first half. And also aerospace, which continue to build momentum like what we talked about earlier. And rail, utilities, and uh, some part of geospatial will start uh, bringing growth in the second half of uh, the financial year. Okay, okay, got it. Uh, and then on margins uh, for Ajay, uh, just trying to understand uh, what are the tailwinds uh, that are we expecting in the margin guidance uh, we're baking in this year? And uh, based on the uh, wage hike uh, numbers that you're planning, what's the uh, additional impact this year versus last year that we're baking in, in the overall margin guidance? I would say that, you know, in terms of the uh, uh, device that we are going to use, I think they are going to be similar to uh, what we have been doing uh, in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, the, uh, you know, internal operational efficiency, uh, which we have been driving, uh, we are also looking at a uh, lot of uh, automation. We are also going to look at looking at this inflation that we discussed and also the attrition issue. I think uh, we are working on the price increases uh, with the customer. Uh, because, uh, you know, this whole phenomena is not specific to us. It also applies to our customers. So that's another level that we are uh, planning for. Scale is definitely something which will uh, further benefit. Uh, the uh, heights are going to be higher than the last year in terms of the overall impact. At this stage, as I said, you know, uh, while definitely we made some provisions in the budget, uh, and, you know, uh, some of our employees are also our investors, and they may be on the call. I don't want this to become a town hall for the guidance to be employed. So I would say it is definitely going to be, as I said, we will do what it takes to retain the people and make sure we take care of them based on uh, the best uh, uh, market valuation. I would say it will be higher than the last year, but we'll be able to mitigate it by internal uh, improvements as well as the pricing. If you look at all the situations that are developing, Pricing is one uh, lever that will really uh, work. And with handsome growth, we will definitely get uh, further improvements that will come on uh, uh, scale. And we'll continue to make the uh, investments, as I already said. Sure, thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Shraddha from Asian Market Securities. Please go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thanks for taking my question. Uh, just one question. There's a press uh, release on BSC talking about some class actions we filed against us. Can you provide more details on the thing? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. So there, there, is a, there is a lawsuit that has come up in the U.S., which is a uh, civil uh, lawsuit, uh, which uh, um, uh, was brought um, by uh, one of the states, or the second state, sorry, in the U.S. Uh, we are... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, excuse me. We are addressing uh, the issue. We do not see that uh, there is a major risk based on the facts of the case, etc. 
but uh, we are addressing the issue and we will keep you posted if uh, anything changes uh, either uh, uh, in, in any uh, appreciable manner that things go ahead. But what is this regarding uh, Krishna? Uh, it's, it's alleged on uh, employee uh, hiring. That's what the allegation is around. It, and it's not a lawsuit on, uh, uh, it's not a, sorry, it's, it's a lawsuit on science on employee hiring, but uh, that's what has been alleged in the lawsuit on how our hiring practices. And I want to say this is against a number of companies. It's not just against uh, science, but it's, under, it's against a number of companies uh, in the ecosystem. Sure. And the salary hike will be set to which quarter? Will it be set to second quarter or uh, first quarter? Similar to the last year, I think that it will be over the, uh, spread out over the three quarters. And again, uh, you know, situation, uh, we all discussed that supply side and retention of talent is our first, uh, first priority in this year. So uh, having said that, we will be a little flexible on that. But the initial plan is uh, to have it over the three quarters like the last year. Right. And just last question, sir. Uh, why is our depreciation number coming low every quarter for the last two, three quarters? I think I would say the leasing is also plus there, and we have been uh, letting go of some space, which also hits this particular line. Uh, that's the reason. So don't, uh, I think it's just some space optimization. Uh, and I would say as the growth comes back, uh, uh, definitely we will have to again go back to the space level. So I would say don't read too much into this uh, temporary reduction in the Sure, that's helpful. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is from the line of Amit Chandra from HDFC Securities. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, hi, sir. Yeah, so thanks for the opportunity. So my question is uh, related to the aerospace vertical. So as you mentioned in the commentary that uh, we are seeing recovery in the aerospace. So if you could, uh, you know, if you could break it down, uh, how the recovery is, you know, in the in the top client versus the non-top client, and uh, how the nature of spend in aerospace has been pre-pandemic and post-pandemic. So I think on the aerospace summit, uh, what we are seeing is there is definitely an increase in production capacity. And what has been reduced over the last two and a half years, I think they are likely to come back. And some of them uh, are increasing from 30 aircrafts per month to about 40, 42 during the middle of this uh, year. And they will probably come back to pre-COVID levels of 60 by middle of next year. So that's something which is really driving the growth in terms of productivity, digital industry 4.0 solutions, and helping them to manage their quality inspection and how do you think they can probably have better view on their uh, maintenance. I think they have an opportunity to get it right using digital technologies far efficiently than what they would have done otherwise. And that is an opportunity they're trying to tap into. And the second one is also as the uh, number of hours put up by the aircraft and the aircraft engines are increasing. There is an increase in the maintainability MRO related services and that's something we call them as aftermarket. And whether it is add-on services, spare parts, and trying to assess uh, challenges that are seen by the maintainability and how do you think we can help our customers on those areas. So essentially it is led by manufacturing productivity expansion that they are looking for and as well as the aftermarket side of it. And all of them are led by digital uh, technologies. They feel that they can really uh, bring a lot more efficiency into their operations and that's essentially what is driving the growth in the near term. Okay, okay, sir. So uh, my second question is on the you know on is is on the you know like margin guidance that we have given. So how severe is the onside wage inflation and what kind of uh, you know wage hikes we are you know actually baking in uh, on site specifically uh, in our margin guidance and is it significantly higher than what we have given in the past because on site uh, inflation uh, is uh, you know. Uh, factor which can impact the margins much higher than another you know, offshore inflation. No, absolutely. We are uh, factoring in, uh, like I said, a 4% roughly uh, on-site hike. 
um, again, it is higher than what uh, what it was um, previously. But uh, like you said, you know, inflation is at a situation where it is uh, it's not tenable, um, and uh, therefore these hikes will have to happen. Uh, but again, you know, there are like Ajay articulated in a greater detail. There's a number of uh, opportunities, both to make it up from a tailwind perspective, but also not to read too much as a blanket number because there's just a lot that goes in. I mean, we need to be competitive. We need to maintain margins. We need to service our clients. So there's a lot that's going on. So you know, when we talked about the um, um, uh, outlook, uh, it has all these things baked in and, and uh, baked in at a at a thoughtful um, level. Okay, sir. Thanks, and all the best for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Due to time constraint, we take that as the last question. I now hand the conference over to the management for their closing comments. Over to you, sir. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, thanks for taking the time and uh, being here at this uh, meeting or this call uh, this afternoon. Um, like I said uh, earlier, uh, we feel a lot more confident in terms of what's going on based on uh, some of the operational initiatives, but also some of the or many of the actions that we've taken. So I'll once again, uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for your feedback, and uh, thank you for the patience uh, while we went did go through a rough time uh, in the last uh, couple of years. But I think. Uh, the future looks quite good in terms of uh, where we believe the business stands as uh, as we uh, speak. Uh, we will also do an investor day during the course of the quarter. We haven't quite nailed down the date yet, but we will uh, communicate the date to you. Uh, we will uh, obviously showcase a lot more in terms of both capability, but also uh, clients, etc. And we look forward to your participation. We will share the dates with you. With that, thank you very much. Have a good evening, and I look forward to speaking again uh, next quarter. Thank you. On behalf of Science Limited, that concludes this conference. We thank you all for joining us, and you may now disconnect your lines. Thank you.